Hello everyone and welcome back from your lunch. I hope you had a great time uh, and hopefully you had some good food. Uh, next up in, a, in the Kia Ora Theatre at Linux Conf AU 2022 is Mike Cohen, a renowned digital forensic engineer and senior software engineer who describes himself as a digital paleontologist. Uh, Mike is the founder and creator of Velociraptor, which is an advanced open source digital forensic and incident response framework supporting Linux, Mac OS and Windows. There's so many fouls in digital forensics. <laughs> Uh, today, Mike is talking through hunting for threats on a Linux host using Velociraptor and its query language VQL. Take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm really glad to be here today and talk to you about Velociraptor. Uh, and today we're, we're going to cover some of the uh, Linux aspects or typical investigation that we see uh, when we're doing Linux in incident response or uh, forensic investigations to give you guys a little bit of a taste to how to do forensic response at scale and how Velociraptor can make that easier. So um, specifically, Velociraptor has a lot of capabilities. We're really not gonna even touch on many of the capabilities that it has. Uh, and we're gonna cover a lot of the, the things in very briefly, but because this is a Linux conference, um, then we're gonna really look at uh, typical Linux use cases. And uh, since it's an open source conference, uh, I'm hoping to give you guys a bit of an idea as to how to join the open source uh, project and contribute and uh, and uh, and use that. So, um, what is Velociraptor? And I've spoken about uh, Velociraptor in Linux Conf. Um, I think last year there was um, a workshop about it, so you know we we covered it in a lot of depth. Uh, but it is an open source tool. Uh, that's really designed for um, for digital forensic and incident response, and uh, and also alerting and detection. And essentially, it's a way of making it easy for us to manage uh, or investigate uh, at scale. Uh, so, the the thing that makes Velociraptor really cool is that it has a query language called VQL, and VQL is really kind of at the core of Velociraptor. It makes it do everything, and we're going to cover some of the um, some of the things that we can do with VQL today and how we can use that in the real world. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's just a bit of a taste. Um, oops. All right, so let's have a look at generally what Velociraptor looks like. So we have a Velociraptor server. Usually we deploy it in the cloud um, and it basically, it connects with uh, assets which could be laptops or servers or essentially any kind of uh, uh, system that runs the agent. So we have support for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux agents. Uh, today we'll talk about Linux. Uh, but the agents are connected uh, persistently to the server. So that means that we can investigate each of these agents with, you know, within seconds. We don't need to wait for them to poll or anything like that. We can immediately get results from them. And then we have the admin UI, which uh, we use that to manage the deployment. So I actually have a bit of a demo today. So uh, I'm just going to show you guys what the admin UI looks like. And as you can see, um, we have uh, just the, the welcome screen. There is a dashboard over here that uh, you know just tells us uh, some information about this deployment, uh, like how much disk space there is and things like that. And uh, today in this demonstration, I have, um, I have about 1,000 clients connected, so 1,000 endpoints connected. And uh, and the server is you know kind of waiting for us. We're going to do some some uh, interesting work on that. So if I just um, search for my clients, I can see these are all my clients here, and um, you know I can look at each of them randomly and see some information about it, including um, collecting sort of telemetry, you know about like how how much CPU and usage it's you know that each client is taking, each endpoint is taking. But uh, let's just um, so just showing you how I can co control each client, each, uh, we call clients the um, the assets, right? So they are the clients. Okay, so typically um, we it's very efficient, it's really fast, designed to collect a lot of data real quickly um, and because uh, most of the work is done by using the query language, which runs on the endpoint. So you'll see that later when we're going to do some pretty heavy lifting and you'll see the endpoints are doing a lot of work. So even if we hunt for it with uh, many, many endpoints, then uh, we will we will be able to uh, very quickly um, 
see um, Go we're going to very quickly uh, see that it, it you know they all scale really quickly. All right, so. Um, the, the idea behind VQL is instead of having specific analysis modules, um, we have generic, what we call VQL plugins. And those plugins uh, perform some low level forensic analysis, such as uh, parsing files. Uh, you know, in, in the Windows world, we have you know, NTFS parsing, MFT, and so on. Uh, in the Linux world, we have parsing using Grok, SQLite, and so on. Uh, and binary parsing. We're going to look at some of those today, but instead of just having like a module that just does, you know, we're going to look at, you know, browser history. We have generic parsers, and then the query uses that to uh, to build a more complicated query um, parser out of that. So, so this is the point of having the query language. We can string together different basic building blocks to create a more complex and capable. Um, capability so because this is all about open source and this conference you know really focuses on a lot of the open source aspects as well uh, because it's an open source we have a vibrant community of people who write these vql queries for us so uh, if you just wanted to know uh, how to do a particular forensic analysis or particular uh, or look for a particular threat then probably there's going to be someone that had written a vql query that they would share with the world and that, that allows us to kind of crowdsource these capabilities. So we have uh, on our website, let me just quickly point out. Uh, so this is our uh, website, docs.velociraptor.apps. There's going to be links at the, you know, at the end to it. But we have this thing called uh, the Artifact Exchange. And this is where people share the, the different artifacts. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different artifacts here. Um, you know, for example, log, uh, log4j. Uh, detection, you know, someone has uh, contributed uh, log4j uh, artifact, and this is the VQL that runs. Um, so we can simply share those uh, easily. So let me just show you quickly. Uh, in Velociraptor, we call artifacts are those VQL libraries uh, that contains those queries. And so these are the ones that come, you know, uh, built in. And you can see that, you know, this is the query here, and these are all built in. Right, uh, and we can actually leverage that uh, artifact exchange to obtain all of that community sourced uh, artifacts. So these are built in, and I can simply import those artifacts. So I just uh, choose to run a server collection uh, and search for import in the artifact and select this. Uh, this artifact. So it's it's like there's a built-in artifact that a built-in query that populates the server with the community queries, basically. So when we when we collect that from the server, um, then it will go off and fetch, uh, you know, and, and fetch the um, all of the other artifacts and insert them into the server. We're, we're going to use those today, so that's why I'm, I need to do that first. Um, and you can see that. Uh, now, when I look at all of our, so these are like our artifacts, which are a saved queries, essentially. Uh, there are the built-in ones from before, but then there are ones with the little user icon. These are the contributed artifacts that came from the artifact exchange. So we can see these are all the ones. And we're going to use some of those today. So so now we have those loaded, so we can use them. Um, so let's, uh, so the artifact exchange, again, is a place for exchanging, uh, you know, uh, these community contributed artifacts queries, uh, and we just imported it from the um, artifact exchange by just going to new collection from the server. So, um, so let's have a look at some actual example. Like, how do we, how we, how can we actually use this VQL to um, to create some actual um, something useful, right? So let's, uh, and I'm going to go through a bit of the process of creating your own content to try and give you guys the idea of uh, how you can use VQL creatively to make some new content, to, to make new detections and new new ideas. So uh, the first example that we're going to look for is detecting SSH logging events. And because, you know, Linux typically, uh, a lot of the investigations that, you know, we do on Linux are around SSH compromise 
lateral movement happens by uh, compromising SSH keys, and you know, and then sometimes we have to go through and recover. Um, you know, where, who 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 logged into this machine? Where did they come from? These kind of things. So SSH is a big part of Linux investigations, not the only part, but we're gonna we're gonna look at that as an example today. Um, so we're gonna look at uh, how do we leverage SSH logs to try and understand how this kind of attack chain occurs. Um, so let's take a look at uh, what does an SSH log look like? And you've all seen, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> SSH logs. Uh, typically, they're logged through syslog. Uh, and there's a file in syslog, the var log, auth log. And it contains, or in, in, on different systems, it's in a different location, perhaps. Uh, but essentially, syslog is uh, is the defect, the default logging system on Linux, or I think pretty much all Linux systems use syslog. But syslog is not uh, especially easy to work with. The, uh, the difficulty with syslog is that it, it consists of line-based unstructured logs. So it's essentially just, you know, like a print, you know, statement. Essentially, you're printing a, a, a line, and that means something, right? But from a, um, a DFIR perspective or, you know, an investigation of forensics, it's it's unstructured, so it's very hard to to uh, to associate it with anything, you know, like to make queries on it because it's uh, it's unstructured. <clears throat> so typically, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a line, and it has all the key pieces of information in it that we want, but they're kind of like all over the place, right? So it has the date, and as you can see in syslog, even it doesn't have the year, which is terrible. <laughs> Um, and then it has the host name, it has the servers, the service, and then and then it has some key pieces of information, like whether the key was accepted, the connection was accepted or rejected. So we have the word accepted here. And then we have uh, what kind of authentication it was from here, and then who's the user, and IP addresses, and so on. And this is really bad. Uh, this is really hard um, to, to query against, right? So when we do an investigation, usually what we need to do is convert this unstructured, you know, essentially text soup, I would say, into structured logs that we can query, you know, in a proper way. And usually the way this works, um, well, you know, I mean, you can write like regular expressions to try and find little bits and pieces from that. And, you know, essentially the way uh, that the industry is kind of settled on solving this problem is using something called Grok. Uh, Grok is just like a way of expressing very complicated regular expressions in a little bit simpler way. So these end up essentially being very large regular expressions still. And you're kind of matching that against what the log is supposed to look like. And sometimes it sort of works. So <laughs> that's kind of, I guess that's that's the state of uh, <laughs> that's the state of um of logging on Linux is not great. So, um, so this is the best we can do. So let's just have a look at how we can use VQL to get some structured information from these syslogs. And I'm going to show you how to quickly write a VQL query. So the first thing that we do <clears throat> is we have this thing called a notebook. And a notebook is like something um, that we can use to build up, uh, to build VQL and run it interactively, sort of like uh, if you've ever used a Jupyter notebook, so it's sort of similar to that. So I'm going to open this notebook here that I've prepared earlier, just for the sake of time, uh, and going through the example of parsing SSH logs. And so I'm I'm going to give some I'm going to talk about some of the VQL and point out how it's used to parse these logs. So just for uh, to get better real estate on this screen, I'm just going to change it into full screen, so it's a little bit easier to see. So a notebook consists of uh, these are called cells, and they're kind of invisible initially. But if you click on it, then you know they become obvious. Uh, and then we can edit each cell. So each cell is like it's kind of it has a query, and then it runs that query. So you can see here, this is the VQL query uh, here. And so the first query, we're just going to grab the files out of the auth logs, right? So uh, uh, sorry, grab the lines out of the auth logs. So you know, as I said, syslog is just a line-based format, so it's just they're just straightforward lines. And so you can see that this query, what it does, uh, there is this thing called a plugin called pars, uh, uh, pars lines, and then pars lines basically grabs each line and 
puts it out into a variable called line. So this is a query, and as a, because it's a query, it returns a series of rows and columns, right? So queries always always return rows and columns, and so we can have this is actually a whole bunch of rows, and that's the column called line, right? So so this is how we would uh, now in VQL in in here. Uh, you know, we can we can use command line completion and things like that. So we can see like what parameters does you know this plugin use. Uh, you know, or we could do like you know select star uh, from, and then we can see these are all the plugins that we could use. Um, you know, pause, and we can search for it. So so this is the uh, preferred interface to write your query because it really helps you with, with writing the query. Once you write the query and you click save, then it recalculates it. So in this particular case, we are pulling 50 lines out of the first log. So that's the first step is to just get the lines out. But again, they're not structured at this point. So what I want to do is I want to convert them into something structured. And I use the Grok expression. That's the big expression that you see before. And these things are available on the, on the net um, and there's libraries of them. So it's not like you have to come up with them yourself. But the, it's basically it expands into a, a big regular expression that matches that line, like I mentioned before, and it converts it into a structured uh, format. And you can see that's that's the structured format. It's like it creates uh, uh, the whole thing basically uh, splits into a dictionary, and then you know it has these different fields. So it ex it pulls out specific things. Now you'll see that the the sad thing is that the timestamp again is <laughs> has no year in it, so it's like it's not easy to parse. Um, but you know, uh, we've got all the key pieces of information, whether it was accepted, you know, what kind of thing it was, public key, private key, et cetera, program, et cetera. So, so we can use that to essentially pull out these structured information. So let me just, um, so now once, once we have that, we want to actually create something called an artifact because we don't want people to have to type all of these VQL into the GUI each time, right? It's kind of a, a pain and error prone. So what we want to do is have have it somehow encapsulated so we can publish it in an artifact. So luckily, uh, that let me just get out of full screen mode and go back to our uh, artifact library here. And if I search for SSH, then luckily, uh, oh no, this is this is this. Uh, there is a built-in one which is actually exactly the same as before. Uh, it, it's just now it's just kind of like encapsulated inside of this thing called artifact, which is we can just use. So we don't need to type any of these queries in. We could just use them, uh, and you can edit it and customize it. You know, so this is the query that we've had before. It's a little bit more complicated now because it's going to look for different files in different places because it could be a number of auth logs and it could be zipped up and etc. Right. So, but you know, this is a very simple thing. Um, and uh, let's just uh, let's just find my favorite machine. Uh, let's uh, pick up uh, this one, one of my recent hosts. And uh, and this is this is uh, I've got a tag on it called Mike, right? So I've got a label on that machine, so I can go to it straight away quickly. Uh, and let's have a look at all the artifacts that we've collected before. So I've collected some other ones before, right? For example, I, I grabbed like uh, different files and so on. Uh, but let me just add. Uh, let me just search for this SSH login. Okay, so. Uh, in this case, what I want to do is search for that uh, SSH login again. It just it just goes through and it, it takes parameters here. Uh, so this is just the defaults. So then the next step, I'll configure the parameters for this artifact. Uh, and you'll notice that I mean the, the VQL is in there, but I don't really need to know anything about it. So I don't need to really parse it or anything. Um, I've got some defaults that I can change. Like maybe if my logs are in a different place, I can look for them. Uh, and this is the Grok expression that I can maybe tweak a little bit. Maybe it's a, a non-conventional version of SSH and the logs are a little bit different. Yeah, that happens. Um, uh, but anyway, the defaults are usually fine. We'll just launch it and uh, and go off and collect it. And you'll see that it's you know it's finished in 0 0.15 seconds. It just got it, essentially as soon as I task this endpoint, it went off and collected that thing and passed it, right? And then if I look at my results, then I've got all the SSH logs, all the SSH logs. Um, and you can see clearly that this is a problematic machine, right? Right away. Why? Because we're seeing all these failed password logins. So somehow this machine is getting. Uh, if you've ever run, you know, Linux machines on the internet, of course they're going to get brute forced all the time. Uh, so these failed passwords, you know, you, you're going to see them a lot if your machine is available on the internet. 
Uh, you'll see the accepted public key, which is the legitimate users using keys, and that's prob that's fine probably. Um, but then you have a whole bunch of passwords here. Um, but what would be really bad? What would be really bad if this machine had a successful attempt with a password? Because that is not good, right? Like so, normally you're supposed to use keys, and if someone's brute forcing the password and got in, then you know, then that's not good, right? So what we can do is we can do this thing called post-processing of the data. So we've collected all the data with the artifact from this machine. And uh, I can open up a notebook just to post-process that one collection. And, uh, and it's the same thing. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this query. And I'm just going to add the condition. So it, it returns all these rows. But I just want to see the rows where the result right, matches accepted. All right, because so that uh, equal tilde is the regular expression match operator. Uh, and uh, method matches password. Okay, so if someone got in with a password, you know, that would be super bad, right? And so immediately that thing pops up to me. It's like, hey, that is not cool, right? Someone used the password. Now, it could well be configured to do that. Maybe it's okay, but usually um, that requires further in, in inspection. So, so let's just go back to the slides uh, and recap so we don't go too far ahead of the, of the slides. Um, so we used VQL. We could use VQL to parse each line out of the file. Uh, and then we applied a grok expression to create a structure out of the um, text soup of the syslog, right? And then, um, and then we wrapped it in something called an artifact, which basically is a YAML file with metadata. So it has a name and it has parameters that are declared as part of the, the artifact. And um, you can see that uh, here if I um, simply find it again. So this it's built in, right, but in this case. But um, you can click Edit, and then you can see this is what an artifact looks like, right? It has different parts, the name, description, references, and then it has these parameters section. And those are the things that we can change, you know, when we run it. So essentially that query, you don't need to really kind of, I mean, you can look at it, right? But you, you don't need to really type it each time. Once that artifact is created, then uh, it's just ready to be used by anyone, right? Um, and so it can be easily discovered. We just search for it and ran it and it was done, right? So all we did is we can search for it in our artifact library, which is that, um, third uh, thing here, um, you can <laughs> you can view artifact screen, right? Uh, and then uh, and then we selected it. We can look at it. We can customize it, and we can collect it. So we've collected it on a system. This was the system that we were looking at. So the one that shows up up the top here. So you know, in this case, it was this machine here, right? And then we went to collected artifacts, and we collected that artifact, and you know. Um, so that's what we are doing with that machine just specifically. Uh, but now uh, we would really like to be able to do it like everywhere. Like, you know, like we have a thousand machines, right? So we want to know, you know, did anyone, you know, pass, put, put for a password in any of our, you know, machines. So going from uh, investigating one machine to investigating a thousand machines is easy. Uh, it's called a hunt. So we just go and hit hunt manager, create a new hunt, look for password logins, description. Uh, and this tells me like how many machines it's expecting that it will apply to. And if I say run everywhere, that's all my deployment. Uh, I can match it by label. And you know there's only one machine that has that label. So I can just target it just with that uh, label. Or if I just match it by um, <clears throat> all my Linux machines, in this case, they're all Linux anyway. So, so that you know that's all of them. Um, and then if I just simply click uh, search for SSH, uh, we're going to do the same thing, but on all our thousand machines, and and then just go right. So uh, when we, you know, see how it's in the post state, so we can just start it, all right. And you can see that as soon as I click start, it's starting to schedule it, and it goes off, uh, you know, scheduling it for all the machines, right? Two hundred, three hundred. It's going to go off and collect the results from every single one. Now, because each one of them is doing it in parallel, they are all coming back pretty quick, um, and so you know we can uh, we can see the um, the results as they come in. So let me just uh, let me just see where I'm. 
Okay, so that's hunting and processing. So the same thing is happening, but on multiple machines. And you can do the post-processing on the hunt as well. And, and, and we've seen that. Let me just uh, move on to the next example real quick. Um, and so in this example, we're talking about unsecured SSH keys. So again, SSH is our theme today. So let's look at um, uh, how uh, SSH keys should be protected. Now, we all know that we need to protect our SSH keys with at least the passphrase, because if we don't, then someone can that can break into that machine, they can just use those SSH keys, the unprotected ones, to uh, laterally move from that machine to all the other machines on the environment, right? Without having uh, any impediments, right? So essentially that key becomes, you know, a liability. So we need to uh, protect them with a password, but you know, like on many environments, for instance, in AWS, when you get a key pair, they're not encrypted or not protected. And a lot of people just look at them and they're like, okay, cool, and they use them, but they don't realize they need to go through that extra step of actually encrypting them uh, and so they have a lot of these keys lying around the environment that are not protected. So what we want to do here is we want to find, you know, all the keys in the environments that are not properly encrypted. So let's take a look at how we can parse these, these files, these private key format. So let me just uh, show you like how you come up with this, idea, um, this uh, query for something quite new. So again, I've got an example here of... Um, of uh, you know a new, a new notebook, I'll just make it full screen again, um, and uh, we can see that the first query, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to read that file, right? This is uh, my private key. Uh, I'm just going to read it, and I have a read file function in VQL, and I can see that it looks like you know it has this uh, header, a uh, private key, and then it has a whole bunch of what looks to be base64 encoded something. And then there's a, a tail on the end, so that's that's cool. So then clearly the thing in between the the thing between here and there is looks to be base64 uh, encrypted uh, encoded, right? So let's um, let's take a look at how we decode it. And um, what I'm going to do the first thing is I'm going to use a regular expression to pull out uh, the data between the key, the start, the the header, and the end, right? And that will give me the first part, which is just that base64 bit, right? And then in the second part, I'm going to decode it with base64 decoding. And so I can see straight away, this is what, you know, so there's a whole bunch of binary data, but straight away, you can see that there is something here, right? It says open SSH key and it has none and none. And if you look, and there's a whole bunch of information here that could be useful as well, like inside the key, so that where it was made and things like that, and you know the the type of key that it is and so on. So there's some information here that is quite useful, but uh, but all this thing is you know binary. So now we have this problem of like okay, we have all this binary data and I can see stuff in there, but I have no idea how to parse it out. So let's uh, so let's do some research on Google. What is this binary blob? Uh, what is the structure? Um, so we have this, there is a, someone has done some research, which is great, uh, and describing the, uh, the format. So let's go to that site here. Okay, so this is just a page on the internet that explains the format. And you can see here, uh, the format is a binary format and there is like, there is a description of, you know, so th there's like the length and, and some, um, uh, it explains how the binary data is, you know, structured, right? So we can take this information and we can build a binary parser to extract this this uh, fields out of the binary data. So, uh, like, you know, you can write a Python script or something to get it out, but uh, in VQL, we actually have built-in binary parser. Uh, and I just want to quickly show you that I'm not going to go into details about the parser, uh, but in this private keys one, I'm just going to show you what the puzzle looks like. So it's kind of like a descriptive thing. There is a profile that we can use to describe how each field is laid out. So, you know, that's that's the header. There's a magic, magic string at offset zero. And then the length of the cipher is at offset 15. And it's a UN32 big endian. Uh, and then the cipher itself, which is the string that describes, you know, what cipher is used to encrypt it, uh, is at offset 19. And, you know, the length is given by, you know, that other field. So, so we can have this. So this is this is this is a description 
of, uh, of the binary format. And we can use that to pass the keys out. So again, the same thing, we're gonna go out to our machine here and we're gonna add another collection and let's look for our private keys. Okay, so here's our private key on a real machine uh, and we're gonna collect this artifact. Again, we don't need to necessarily understand the VQL, we just need to know how to use it. So if we go over here, we can change the parameters uh, this one, basically, there's a bit more complexity in the uh, in, in this artifact because it can search for keys everywhere, and we want to make sure that it doesn't go into proc and you know and then get lost in there, right? So, uh, so we can so so there's a few more functions you know, functionality than you know we've just described, uh, but basically we go off and and collect this thing, and it comes back in you know a matter of seconds, and we can see oh look you know this user has a key and it's protected, so that's great. So so this is good. Right, we checked it, and and that's good. So, um, but you know, maybe that key has other uh, that user has other keys lying around, right? So we only by default search for the keys. If you look at the parameter, uh, or the the, per the default parameter uh, only uses it in slash home slash ubuntu sshd, which is the location where normally the keys sit, right? But let's uh, let's um, search. We copy that artifact, and we we can tell it to search. You know everywhere, so that's the default search pattern, which is wildcards, right? And we can just make it if if we do star star, that's like a recursive search through this, the system. We look for uh, PAM, ID, RSA, or ID DSA. These are the three types of names that we're going to search for. And uh, and you know we go ahead and we do that, and uh, and it's it's going to take a little bit longer because it's going to search through the whole system. So I'm going to leave it for a couple of seconds, and we'll come back to it later. Um, but you can see that, just recapping, uh, we read the file, we base64 decoded, we noticed there's some binary data, and we created a parser for it. Now, because the parser is in VQL, we don't really need to rebuild or recompile or redeploy or anything, right? We just, we just you know, write the VQL, it's descriptive, and it, the VQL can go ahead and uh, dissect that data out of the endpoint, right? So, so then, you know, we wrote it into an artifact, and then we collected it from the artifact uh, um, repository here. And uh, let me just see if it's finished. Yeah, it's 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 only taken uh, 16 seconds to go over the file system. It's only a Cloud VM, so it's quite small. It could take longer on other systems. But we can see uh, that this user has some AWS keys here, and they don't have any ciphers. So this immediately, because that's the default way that AWS creates those keys, this user didn't in you know, go to the extra step of re-securing their keys after they downloaded them from the AWS console. So this is this is really problematic. And this is a really big deal. We can see lateral movement through these keys all the time, right? Because people don't do that. So this is now we can go uh, ahead and, uh, and you know, tell that user, hey, you know, um, you've done the wrong thing, let's fix it. But let's just think about what actually happened here um, is that we could actually do that, uh, we could actually do that as a hunt on all the systems. Um, Maybe we can do that real quick. Um, you know, I've, I've shown you how to do that before, but like, you know, uh, search, search for PAM. Uh, and again, we do the same thing for the private key. So it's the same process, right? But we're just gonna do it, you know, everywhere instead of on one machine uh, and then go for it. And what's gonna happen now is that all of our machines are gonna go, like all thousand of them, and it could be more, right? They're gonna go and search for that on their own system, but because each one is doing it sort of in parallel, then it still doesn't take very long to uh, to do that. So they go come back and getting the, the results, you know? So like, just like before, uh, let's recalculate it. So before we found all the logins, right? The same thing. So they all came back from all the machines, right? Then we could still do the post-processing. Then uh, in this case, we, uh, we're we doing the, the same thing. Uh, see if the results are here yet. No, they're still coming. Um, and uh, and, and then we can we can find that. Oh, here we go. So we've got some data there, and uh, yeah. So we can we can then see you know everybody's you know keys and so on that that are uh, these these all of these machines, thousand machines are kind of virtual, all on the same machine. So we're going to get the same data, but you get the idea of hunting. So this is cool. The other thing that's cool about it. So this is how we created the new hunt. We configured it, uh, and then we ran it. Now, the interesting thing about it is that we haven't uh, actually downloaded anyone's keys, right? So it's not like we went out 
grabbed all the keys and ran a Python script locally to check are they encrypted? Because obviously that would be like really bad, right? Because we don't want to go and copy everybody's private keys, right? So having it done by the endpoint uh, means means that we can we we don't have to get the data centrally. All right, last uh, last example: recovering deleted logs. So we looked at uh, how uh, you know the logs look at syslog, uh, but let's say in a lot of cases, you know, people delete the logs or uh, compromises happened so long ago that the logs got rotated. Uh, maybe a few weeks, you know, four, it's, normally it's like four weeks after, and then they get rotated out. Depending on the rotation policy, uh, those logs can be aggressively rotated. So in that case, we we'd really we really need to go back in time and try and find forensic evidence of uh, these compromises from the logs, uh, and we try to recover deleted logs. Now, if we if we are back to that, you know, this is this is not good, right? It's not a good outcome. It's better to have logs, right? But if you are struggling. Uh, and we don't have logs, then we can use a technique called carving. And carving is a very simple technique where we basically look for patterns in unstructured data. And the idea is that when someone deletes those logs, then the data is still on the disk. So we we might be able to find it, you know, from just the disk unstructured data. So let me just uh, show you an example of how that how we how we do that. Uh, so in this uh, particular example, let me just make it full screen again. So the idea is to try and look for uh, patterns that look like a syslog message, right? So uh, we've seen before that a syslog starts with uh, Jan, February, March, like the month name, and then it has the, the dates of the month, and then it has, you know, the, the time. And then we know that, you know, it's a line. So we, we're going to take all the characters until the next new line. So that's one line. So when we do this, we can, so we, we're going to do this query here. We use a tool called Yara which is uh, used for uh, essentially applying regular expressions at scale. It's very fast and efficient and so on. Uh, and so we can do that on, uh, ideally we want to do it on a device in the end, but for testing, we're just going to do it on the real file to find the right regular expression and so on. And so, you know, we go ahead, we, we grab that file and we run the Sierra expression on it and it's supposed to uh, hit on all of the all of the lines that sort of look like that, right? That sort of look like maybe a syslog line, right? So when, when I run this, the first query, so that's this one, uh, you can see that there is, you know, some hex data here and it matches, you know, that kind of pattern, right? So we got the gen 16 and then it goes all the way to, and again, no, no year, right? But, um, you know, so this basically pulls out our log lines or things that look sort of like a log line. So, you know, uh, then what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, extract the actual hit and look for only things that sort of look like maybe SSH logins, right? So it has to have the word either accepted or failed. That's really all we care about in this case. And so, you know, that's the second query here. And so you can see the hit is uh, essentially, you know, uh, the SSH keys, right? So it's accepted, a login, accepted, login, and so on, right? So so basically all we do is we write this thing and then we just, and, and then again, we do the same thing, we grok it and all the rest, right? And so we can apply that and get, uh, and then carve out uh, the, um, uh, the SSH logs that could be deleted. So let's have a look at, this one comes from the exchange. So again, it's a publicly, publicly con contributed content. And again, this is the query this is the regular expression that finds out the error rule. And then this is the grok expression. Um, okay, so let's go over here and carve it. Now carving takes a long time because you are really looking for the raw disk, right? So if we actually look at, uh, it's, it's, it's looking at the raw device and then just looking for patterns that sort of look like SSH um, um, messages, right? So it could take, a while to do. It's going to scan all the disks. I and mean, this is a, a cloud machine, so it's not that big, but it could take a while. So let's just leave it um, and we'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so just recapping. Uh, and then we're going to see some hits over here. Um, we're going to see that later. So in the last five minutes, I just want to uh, show you guys another cool feature in Velociraptor, which is about monitoring events from the endpoints. So normally when we run a query, we talked about VQL. And you can see it's really quick and it finishes and gives you uh, uh, a, a table. But it doesn't have to finish, right? So the query actually returns data as soon as it's available. So that means that if we can write a query that runs sort of forever, right? 
uh, then as soon as something happens, it will return stream data back. So VQL can support streaming queries. And that is where event queries ha um, uh, go in. So you can write a query that is running all the time, but it's constantly streaming back uh, re um, you know, rows. And then that row, those rows can simply be forwarded to the server, and then we are collecting those as events. So we can use that for a number of things. We can use it for monitoring, and also we can use it for response, for creating, uh, for automating response. So we can go and do stuff based on those, those queries. So here's an example of, uh, I just wanted to show you guys the query here. How do we turn that other query that we did before, which was, remember we had uh, parse lines, which just goes off and reads the lines, but there is a similar event version of that query called watch syslog, and that is watching the, the lines. So it's essentially like a tail, uh, um, a tail dash f or you know, something like that, um, uh, or, uh, or a, a less with a, a tail following or whatever, right? So it, it looks at the end of the file and just watches for new lines to appear, and then it releases each line into the query. So it never terminates, but once we run this query, it will always work and, and then just grok the lines as they come and then filter them out and if they're SSH, then it will say, hey, that's that's a, you know an interesting one, and it will pass it on. And so we can use that to, um, to monitor for SSH logins. So there is this uh, artifact here, which is Windows event SSH login. I'll just quickly show you that. So again, we're going to look for SSH. And this one is an event version of that. And we can see that it's a, it's a slightly different type, but it's still the same kind of general structure. It's still a, an artifact. And, but to install it, we have to go into this screen here, uh, which shows us uh, the uh, event monitoring on the client. So we can target it specifically to uh, a label group, say Mike, uh, and you know, and then otherwise it's kind of the same um, UI, right? So we just select which ones we want, and then we can configure them and so on, right? And um, and then once we do that, then the event starts streaming in. So we can see that. So in this case, for instance, uh, you can see that there is one event that came in. Uh, I had them on before, so I can show you how it looks like. Uh, when someone logs in, then immediately that event is streamed to the server. So it's not log forwarding. It's not just forwarding all the logs indiscriminately. It's doing the querying and processing on the endpoint directly, and then just for forwarding back uh, just those ones that are relevant to the query, right? So we can do we can do both. We can uh, forward all the events, or we can do the post uh, process, the pre-filtering and the processing on the endpoint, and just forward back those really high-valued. I mean, this is a really high-valued event, uh, you know, and it could be sitting be between thousands of syslog lines, right? We don't care about those; we just care about this one. So they all go in the same place, right? Uh, then the let me just finally the last uh, thing that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, so this is how we collect the events, right? We just run and we see those uh, things. The last thing that I wanted to show, uh, to talk about is Sysmon. And Sysmon is really exciting. It's Sysmon is like the default, um, I guess, kernel events monitoring tool for Windows. So it's been around for a long time on Windows. And just recently they've uh, released a Sysmon for Linux based on eBPF. Uh, and uh, we've talked a lot about eBPF in this conference, especially in the kernel hacking uh, mini conf early on, uh, early on in the conference. So eBPF is a method for us to be able to get information from the kernel about things like process execution, network connections, all that really good stuff from the detection perspective. Um, and Sysmon is now a nice, easy way of getting into that. Um, it's still immature, you know, it's still a little bit buggy, uh, but it has a lot of interest from the community. Everybody's excited about it. Um, it still has some shortfalls. Uh, uh, but I'll just show you how, how it looks like. like the, sys, the Sysmon, uh, the sys internal version itself just writes the syslog, which is terrible because then you have to apply these regular expressions to get the data out. Um, so I've uh, written a patch to fix it, to uh, write it to Unix domain socket so it's a lot more efficient and JSON encoded. And so we can use this plugin called Netcat, which connects to the Unix domain socket and reads all the lines out. Uh, and but otherwise it's exactly the same parse the JSON and show it. So um, let me just quickly show you what that looks like. Uh, so all we do is we just collect that from our endpoint. 
Uh, and you can see that it's basically, uh, it's, it's giving us this structured information about you know, process execution. Like here's a PS command line that ran, uh, you know, where it ran from and so on. A lot of these fields are, they kind of all only make sense on Windows, but maybe there isn't really an equivalent, you know, source, data source for it on Linux, but um, but you can use them to just like filter and say, oh, you know, when this process ran, what was the parent process, what did it do? And then you can write detections based on that. So again, Thank you this so much, Mike. We've run up against time, and we need to keep on schedule. Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, so just last last slide, um, just references. Check out the uh, the the website, the GitHub, uh, and the Discord. And um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that you can drop some uh, of those links and answer the questions in the text chat in Venulus. Uh, up next at three at uh, two twenty five. PM ADT is Jay Rez Rosen Rosenbaum with Role for Initiative, how to make the world of AI a more ethical place. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks.